For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and socially. In the midst of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other than human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. There's still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationship to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, and welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. This podcast is produced and made possible from supporters on Patreon. Thank you. If the Rewilding Podcast inspires you, gives you hope, or makes you think, please subscribe, share it on social media, and become a patron at patreon.com slash Peter Michael Bauer. If you're new to rewilding or want to expand your perception of it, I recommend attending one of my Rewilding 101 workshops, which I offer both in person in Portland, Oregon, and online for those who live around the world via Zoom. You can check you can check upcoming dates and register at rewildportland.com. Fascist ideology has been on the rise with a calculated effort on the part of fascists to infiltrate environmental movements. Rewilding has seen its fair share of this over the years. As a return to our egalitarian roots, rewilding is the political opposite of fascism. And yet, there are footholds of sort within the ideology and worldview that fascists can exploit for their own gain. To protect ourselves from this fascist creep, we need to be aware of it and also aware of the problematic aspects of where our own ideologies can be misconstrued and lead us astray. In this episode, I'm chatting with Kara Delia Schwab. Kara is an anthropologist with a master's degree from the University of Heidelberg. Her thesis was on racism and resistance through media and art in the U.S. She went back to school to get a B.A., in social work and has been working in that field since 2015 with immigrants and refugees mostly. She is a wilderness instructor in training with, let me see if I can pronounce this, Wildnisschule Odenwald. Her plan for the future is to teach foraging classes through her business, Wildnisliebe. <laughs> she has an allotment garden where she grows her own food her ideal life would be writing and spending the rest of the day outside somewhere weaving baskets and working with her hands. Sounds like an ideal life for me as well. Uh, we met at the Rewilding Conference last year where we both attended a session on eco-fascism. And I realized I should have her on the podcast to chat more in depth about this topic. Thanks, Kara, for coming on to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so did I pronounce those correctly first off? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Good German uh, root. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, what's that? Rosetta Stone, the years ago that I took it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, to kind of jump into the conversation, I'd love to sort of know a little bit about um, what rewilding looks like in Germany, or, you know, if it doesn't exactly, if it's mm -hmm. not exactly the same, because, you know, language translations and stuff yeah. mean different things. But, um, you know, what is the movement like there? Um, I'm not sure if it's really comparable to American rewilding, especially the way you would define it. Um, we have a wilderness movement is what I would call it, um, with wilderness schools and, um, the German term for it is wilderness pedagogic, um, which would translate into pedagogy of wildness. Um, mm -hmm. This name is pretty much debated because some people say, hey, it's not really about uh, teaching. It's more about a way of life, lifestyle. Mm. We should rename it, but nobody has yet come up with a different mm. name for it. So mm. it's pretty much in discussion. And um, I think the first uh, wilderness schools were founded like in the late 1980s and 1990s when people came back from courses in the U.S. So they did courses with Tom Brown Jr. and they brought the ideas uh, to Germany and translated um, all of his books um, and, um, you know, were pretty much influenced by Tom Brown and John Young and also um, Tamarack Song is somebody mm. who's very influential here in Germany. He hmm. comes every year and teaches. Oh, wow. I didn't schools. know that. Yeah. And um, most of the people who attend his uh, year long in Wisconsin at the Teacher Drum Outdoor School are Germans, actually. Huh. And the majority of people who come back 
from the year long course. They, um, some of them published books on like uh, animal tracking. It's like a real influential book right now that has been published two years ago and uh, founded their own schools. And so it's a, it's a growing network of these original people and people who were going to their schools and then build up their own. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I remember when I did the Tom Brown Jr. classes in the 90s, um, there were a lot of Germans there. And I was like, this is interesting. Um, and then I read later that there's this whole, you know, Eastern European fetishization of Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And it made a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, that's probably a reason because um, I don't know if you've heard of Karl May. Mm -hmm. um, so the German author who wrote about uh, a perceived wild west um, with um, the way he imagined Native Americans and uh, a guy who was a settler who was a big friend of, of this one uh, particular Native American character. And um, I think the last couple of generations grew up with these books and films. So mm -hmm. I remember growing up with, with books and films from, from Karl May and there was this yeah, strong fetishization, sorry. <laughs> I'm so wrong yes, okay. um, of, of Native American culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that had an influence um, yeah. because, you know, the way uh, Grandfather was invented by, by John Brown mm -hmm. used to, to sell his books. His books um, was basically a very similar idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Behind, yeah. There's actually a, um, in my Rewilding 101 class, one of the assigned pieces of media that I send out is this thing, it's a documentary called Going Native in the Czech Republic. Have you ever seen this? No. Uh -uh. It's, a, it's a documentary in the 90s, and it's about like a, um, a group of people in the Czech Republic who were, you know, influenced by this, this growing fetishization culture. And like the documentary, they bring three Ojibwe elders and fly them to the Czech Republic to hang out with these people who are like speaking Ojibwe, you know, wearing loincloths and living in teepees. And it's just like, um, you know, from the contemporary era of like the understanding of cultural appropriation and all this stuff, it's sort of like cringy in a lot of ways, but it's also like part of their thing is trying to do it as authentically as possible, which is sort of the antithesis of cultural appropriation. If you're actually trying to makes connections and become a thing right um so it's just like a really interesting and awkward awkward documentary but um that's getting off topic a bit i think um yeah. <laughs> so let me let me that's bring it back sure. <laughs> um so there is you know uh an ancestral skills or wilderness skills wilderness um philosophy movement that is parallel um in a lot of ways in germany and it makes me um you know the next question i think for both of us is this um this idea of how does ecofascism um kind of work its way into these movements so what is the sort of um what is this the i think my question should be what is the history of ecofascism within um, germany and the u.s but um and then how does that work its way in but i guess maybe we could we should start with the history right yeah um i think maybe it's important to look at what fascism actually is right um not going too deep in, into the definition but um i was looking at this book from uh, moore and roberts the rise of ecofascism and they define fascism as uh, a combination of three, three things, uh, authoritarian state, racism, and extrajudicial violence. And ecofascism um, is uh, a combination of things as well. Um, it's creating perceived ecological harmony through racial segregation based on place and uh, blaming the ongoing climate crisis on minorities and using migrant migrants as scapegoats so that's something that's happening uh, in Europe a lot and so it's like a combination of anti-immigration uh, blood and soil ideology which is deeply racist by, by itself and is deeply rooted in, in German history of national socialism. Um, what does blood and soil mean? 
Yeah, so what it means is it's a racist idea of connection of bodies, which is quote unquote blood uh, with the land. Um, this is like a perceived homeland of people, the quote unquote soil. And um, it's really like a base ideology of national socialism, which uh, justified the uh, deportation and murder of millions of people, essentially. Yeah. So, um, because if uh, they defined who was German and who wasn't, and everybody who was not German was either, um, you know, segregated and deported or in the end actually yeah. essentially murdered. Yeah. I want to like put a little asterisk here to come back to this. Yeah. Um, to talk about how this plays out in leftist circles today, mm -hmm. but let, but I don't want to distract from kind of some more overall history of of the stuff. So anyway, I just wanted to put a little note that we'll right, come right. back to this. Um. Yeah. So I I really I think this is all very complex, and for me to to really go into how ecofascism plays into rewilding. Um, I think it's important to look at it right-wing ideas. Um, so I'm using this term interchangeably, fascism, ecofascism. Um, there's a there's a rise in all over the world, like in, in Europe especially, uh, in Germany, but I just read a uh, survey today um that about 30 percent of the population either is fully or or partially supporting um right-wing ideas and um we also have like uh um one particular political party right now um they would get like there's another survey if there's um a major election coming on uh let's say sunday so that's the question who would you vote for and about 21 percent of uh, voters are saying that they would vote for this right-wing party which is the second highest vote um of all parties we have in, in germany um and this party um is, is getting really strong and they are talking about uh, what they call re-migration so they say if if uh if they would come into power they would uh deport millions of people who they would not consider German. So this is actually their plan. And um, what... And they're calling it re-migration? They're calling it re-migration. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, it's pretty insane. Um, and when when you look at this party and, and who is actually in, most influential within this party, because they are like... They are, several uh sections and um what was what's one of the most influential sections uh, is their so-called focus wing mm -hmm. which was officially dissolved because uh the government said oh this is like suspicious anti-democratic activity um and uh um the, the secret service was starting to investigate and um so they said the party said oh we were going to dissolve the focus wing but the same people are still um, active and in power, and um, so I don't know. Is, it, is this going? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it makes me think. You know, um, a couple of things. One, okay. just in terms of the dissolvement of this group, like after World War II, there were like, you know, some checks and balances put in place right. to attempt to prevent the rise of fascism in Germany again. Is that correct? Yeah, that and that's correct. But I would say that. Um, there was a part of society that was never denazified, right? So totally. this is like a, a continuity uh, that had been existing since the end of World War II. And these are people who are, are working together in, in strong networks um, nationwide, Europe-wide, and with connections to the U.S. as well to reestablish fascism. So totally. this, is, this is what they do. This is what they're living for. They are um, raising their children in this ideology. They are holding, for example, you know, Hitler Youth style summer camps. And um, whenever an organization of theirs gets banned by the central government, they just rename and reestablish. Totally. Yeah. So, and um, 
is I think it's very important and interesting to look at these networks because when you look at them, you can understand how how it all comes together. Yeah, so you have these this political party, you have the people who are very influential in the party, and those people are connected to these families and folkish ideas that had been in existence since World War II. So there's, there's like a con continuity happening. And um, out of these, these, these folkish families and folkish settlers, because they have a very strong back to the land movement, um, uh, you, you have people who are trying to spread ideas of fascism, of eco-fascism, into society so they have think tanks uh, where they use certain media strategies um, where they have workshops how, how to implement these strategies and um, um, to push all public discourse towards the right and to infiltrate as many um, areas of society as possible and i think this is this is a threat to the wilderness movement as well, especially as the German wilderness movement is very anti-political. So they do not position themselves as anti-fascist um, or as um, anti-racist or any of that. So they, they, I think they are turning like a blind eye on um, possible threats because they, they just don't see that there's a possibility of um, infiltration yeah yeah <clears throat> yeah i mean I, I think it's the exact same situation in the u.s i think there are um like you've said in the past there's definitely these deeper connections between these people across the continents and across the world um you know i mean the the notion of eugenics was very strong in the united states prior to world war ii i mean it was sort of originated here you know the first forced sterilizations happened at through Planned Parenthood um, mm -hmm. long before World War II even. So the, and, and I think it's the same where they're, you know, even after the war, it's not like everybody in the United States was like, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're all anti-fascists now. Um, you know, mm -hmm. no, there's Nazi groups here. There always have been. There were, there was like a Nazi party here during World War II that was like a Nazi political party, you know? Um, that supported the Nazis in Germany. So it's not like uh, it's not like everybody just decided that the Holocaust and the World War II and all those things were like bad, right? Um, collectively, a majority decided that, but the minority has always been there lurking, trying to figure out a way to get power again and has over, you know, in micro pockets here and there. Um, and it's like, I, I really think that it's important, the, the term that you use, think tank, yeah. Um, they do have think tanks. I mean, it's weird because I think about it as just like, I think there's some idea that Nazis on the left, at least the Nazis are just like idiots. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, but they're not. They're super intelligent and they're planning and they're calculating their rise to power. So um, it, I think that the blind eye that people turn isn't so much like a... Um, in, even intentional. I think it's like this thing where, well, they're dumb. They had their chance. They lost the war. It's been over for them. They're never going to get back in power because people have evolved. We're like living in a progressive society now or whatever, right? Like people don't understand how regressive societies can get, especially during economic and environmental collapse. Like, um, you know, I suggest all the time people read the book, The Collapse of Complex Societies by Joseph Tainter. Um, which, you know, goes through a lot of the, the things that happen in collapse. Um, and, you know, oftentimes you get like lots of micro cults and you get, um, you know, states rising and falling from from, you know, the ideologies of domination and authoritarianism and fascism. Um, and so I think, you know, from a rewilding perspective, because I think within the rewilding context, there's an understanding that civilization is unsustainable from the core and that we're in a collapse, um, that we have to be vigilant against fascist the rise of fascism through the collapse which is when it becomes possible for fascists to gain power again because the power structures that exist today are going to fall and what's going to fill that vacuum and they're ready for it you know i mean yeah. i think about like <clears throat> here in the united states there's like 
you know, multiple like brotherhood organizations like the Proud Boys or the uh, Three Percenters, I think is the name of them. You know, there's a bunch of different ones and they're all like militant, you know, larger scale, like the brown coats or whatever. Right. Isn't that what they were called in, in Nazi Germany before the during the rise? Was it brown coats or something? Mm, yeah, I think more like brown shirts. OK, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, like foot soldiers. Totally. Much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Civilian foot soldiers that, you know, essentially become the next military or the next police force um, yeah. when that power vacuum is filled. And I don't really see anything like that on the left because the left is um, by its by its very nature, non hierarchical. And um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, like diffused or. Um, there's there's sort of more amorphous, you know, like um, Antifa or Black Bloc. It's more like um, uh, asymmetrical in a sense to to the hierarchical systems, and so they can't exactly, you know, if a hierarchy has to be faced with another hierarchy, that's a whole other. This is, I'm I'm getting off topic. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but uh, I I can totally agree with with this. Um this very dangerous idea that all Nazis are too slow, you know, because that has been um, like an, um, an idea people had for, for the longest time. And now everybody's surprised that um, this, this party rose to power. And so it didn't start out as a right wing party at all, but they were slowly infiltrated by, by the right and the right finally saw their chance to have a party that had also um, a very civilian and, and conservative um, outlook to the outside, but on the in inside people who were actually, um, as I said before, planning for generations to, to bring uh, fascism back to power. And um, um, it's very important to see that, that they spent their whole life for this, right? So they raise their children in this ideology. Their children go to school. They they learn, I don't know, they go to university. They become judges. They become policemen and women. They become kindergarten teachers. They become school teachers. So they try to get in these very influential positions um, to to actually, yeah, infiltrate um, organizations, schools, the, the justice system, um, the political system. And yeah. they seem to be very successful right now, sadly. Yeah. I mean, I think what you when you said they've been planning it for generations, like, yeah, I think 100 years or more, I've read of people, you know, of these kinds of strategies being that old and that and that and planned that far and ahead, you know, like here in the United States, there was a moment, I don't know, maybe 50 years ago where um, the majority of white supremacists here were like, you know what, we need to create an ethno state. So let's just encourage everybody to move to Idaho, the state of Idaho. And so mm -hmm. for like 50 years, all of these white supremacists are just moving to Idaho. And Idaho is like now, you know, the white supremacist capital of the United States. And it's essentially becoming an ethno state. And now there's this thing called the Greater Idaho Movement, where they're trying to expand the size of Idaho and take over part of Eastern Oregon, the, the state where I live. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody's mentioned the word ecofascism. Nobody's mentioned fascism or any kind of this this stuff. It's all this thing that's like happening in the in the behind the scenes and underground. I think most people don't know, and I can't say for sure, you know, that Idaho is controlled by fascists. But it wouldn't be surprising considering how long they've been there and this idea of keeping things secret and planning succession planning for white supremacy. Right. Yeah. I mean, that seems to be very similar to um, the Polish settlers, you know, so um, they move to parts of East Germany where land is relatively cheap and you have like whole villages that are basically fascist families. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you can say they're eco-fascist in that sense, but I would say yes, because um, blood and soil is their base ideology. So they settle on the land where they see as their perceived homeland and um, they see themselves as the original German people. Um, and um, yeah, so definitely. Right. Um, 
Yeah. So I think this is kind of a good segue into that. Um, well, first, I, I so I want to I want to um, think about how these different uh, people are are using leveraging points within the the rewilding ideology to kind of come into that. But first, I just want to um, kind of preface this by saying, you know, to me, rewilding is uh, looking at the breadth of human evolution and looking at trajectories trying to understand how people have evolved and what our environments of evolutionary adaptations look like to see like, what are we best adapted to, to live in today? Um, and if you look at the majority of evidence, humans have been evolving to be more and more egalitarian by nature over the last like 5 million years or 7 million years since we diverged from whatever ancestor we shared with the chimpanzee. And this, you know, this is outlined in books like Christopher Bain's Hierarchy in the Forest, Sarah Hardy's Mothers and Others, um, and, you know, a bunch of other books around, you know, Daniel Quinn sort of popularized some of these, but Limited Wants, Unlimited Means, a reader on hunter-gatherer economics, has some really great stuff about hunter-gatherer egalitarian societies. Um, and I think the, one of the like cruxes of our issue is like, this attempt to define human nature as either peaceful or dominating. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, Christopher Bame does a really good job in, in Hierarchy in the Forest in showing that society actually informs a great deal of this and that the, there isn't really a human nature towards domination or egalitarianism, or rather, we actually have both. Um, and I think, you know, his framework is that uh, there is a tendency for humans to attempt to dominate, but there's also a great dislike of being dominated. And the third component, which was that we can build coalitions together as a socially organized species. And so for like, you know, a million and a half years, two million years since we've been so-called, you know, humans, there's been this um, cultural uh, push towards um, what he calls a leveling mechanism that prevents any person from dominating any others by a collective dominating the one person that would be the person trying to dominate everybody else. So he calls it a reverse hierarchy or reverse dominance hierarchy where humans use their sort of slightly innate, if there's a such a thing, um, desire to dominate, but we do it collectively to prevent anyone from dominating the whole. <laughs> so instead of one person dominating a whole bunch of people, it's a whole bunch of people dominating the one person who would want, who would be the person who would want to dominate others. This is just one of the theories, right? Um, but I find it super interesting and important because then we do see those changes biologically. We can see that, you know, gender dimorphism, for for example, is one of the factors of like a dominant or hierarchical socially organized animal. Um, and for over a million and a half years or more, the, the dimorphism between males and females within humans has plummeted to the point where, you know, males are now only slightly larger on average than females, uh, biologically speaking, within humans. And so that biological change is huge evidence of egalitarianism, of mm -hmm. Um, you know, the adaptation towards an egalitarian society. So I think this is what I mean when I say that rewilding is innately egalitarian, because if we're trying to get to our, our wildness, um, you know, where we were going for a really long time when we were sustainable, when we were egalitarian societies, um, that, that was the trend, right? Of course, with civilization, with food hoarding, sedentism hierarchy becomes more prevalent and so for the last 10,000 years or so within sedentary hierarchical societies um it's sort of been the opposite of what we were doing for a really long time right. so i think you know it's important to understand the like breadth of context because when we start getting into um the nitty gritty of the ideology i think most people when they think of like going back or, you know, you hear like um, uh, tr embrace tradition or whatever, like these, there's like these certain <laughs> terms, you know, I think what they're oftentimes talking about in terms of fascism, fascist circles are 
the traditions of hierarchical agrarian societies with of the Iron Age, which were essentially deeply warlike hierarchies, right? Which is essentially what exists today. Um, and so I think the the word wild, right, is is I think one of the cruxes here in terms of um, how wildness is perceived by a general population versus people who've really done the work in sort of understanding what anthropology and paleoanthropology and archaeology is telling us about humans, that mostly we were egalitarian and we were moving in that trajectory for a million years. So that's essentially how we're most adapted. Um, but most people don't know that. I think most people think of wildness and they think of hyper aggression, right? Like survival of the most aggressive. <clears throat> And I think this relates back to, um, I don't know the term for it, but I, I'm sure that you probably do. Um, in in Nazi Germany, they were recreating the Orak, or at least they thought yeah. they were doing this, right? I don't know. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah, yeah, we, cool. we can. So what I read about it, it that was actually a pretty interesting book, um, uh, National Socialism and Animals. So um, it, it's only available in German, I think. Um so they try to recreate an, the, the original Aurochs, at, at least that's what I understood there, and um, bred um, characteristics into it that made it very aggressive. And then they released it into the wild, so to say. And um, the problem was, though, that uh, the Aurochs attacked other animals, farm animals, and they basically had to put it down. So at least that's what I know about the story. So yeah. they always had this idea of, of wildness, of being undomesticated, but for them, it only worked as a symbolism, you know? So it's the same with the wolf. Um, for example, um, the wolf was a very strong symbol for the Nazis, right? It was, um, dog was kind of bad, except the German Shepherd, um, which was uh, essentially, especially bred for Hitler, but uh, dog was, was supposed to be um, like a lower kind of animal, but the wolf was superior because the wolf was undomesticated, the original animal of, of the German forest. And, um, and a lot of like uh, uh, military headquarters had, been, had the word wolf in it. Um, but in the end, during that time, the wolf was extinct in Germany. So now it's back. But back then, it was completely extinct for about like 100 years or so. And uh, they didn't make any attempts to bring it back. So they only used it as a symbol, but mm. they didn't want the real <laughs> wild animal that they couldn't control back in the forest. Mm. So that pretty much says a lot about totally. national socialism and, and eco-fascism that they basically use certain ideas to to control people mm. yeah mm. and yeah i mean i find it interesting too because you know and, and this relates to i think this idea of social darwinism of like you know because there's a patriarchy that exists today that means that it's natural or whatever right and mm -hmm. if we then project the patriarchy back in time you have like those images of cavemen dragging a woman by the hair back to the cave or whatever, right? Like it's this projection that what exists today is natural and therefore it must stem from these, you know, earlier ideas or earlier aspects of our humanity or whatever. Um, but with, and and with the, the Oroch project, which still exists today, it's called the Taurus project. Um, and obviously it's slightly different than when it was, um, you know, run by the Nazis or whatever. Um, but the the original idea, you know, was, yeah, to to recreate the auroc. But if you think wildness means aggression and then you selectively breed an animal to look like an auroc and be really mean, that's mm -hmm. not actually a wild animal. That's a domesticated animal that's just really mean and looks right. like an auroc. Right. So it's not any more wild. It hasn't been impacted or influenced by the ecosystem around it. That's what wildness is. Wildness is being in a ebb and flow with your environment and letting your environment shape you as much as you're potentially shaping the other elements of your environment. That's what it means to be, you know, survival of the fit. It's fittedness into an environment, not physically fit and stronger and more aggressive than everything else. 
Right. I think that that idea is like such a deeply seeded aspect and I that that can infiltrate rewilding circles really easily uh, mm -hmm. because it says, you know, hierarchy, aggression is natural. Therefore, hierarchy is natural. Therefore, you know, patriarchy and the, the male being the head of the family and men being in charge and these different things, um, those come into play with these these fascist ideologies of like traditionalism you know, where women must be submissive to men and men are the dominant controlling central figures of the society or whatever. Um, right. um, would you say that um, rewilding circles manage to not reproduce, um, I don't know, things that are going on in general society? Because I think that's something... I see happening in the German rewilding school system that we sometimes reproduce ideas into our circles that are actually coming from the outside and doesn't have, don't have anything to do with rewilding at all. Totally. Yeah. I mean, and I think that the problem there is that um, what I call rewilding is different than I think even, you know, the ancestral skills community. Right. Like, I think there's been a conflation in the last like 20 years of, you know, because the term rewilding emerged from Eugene, Oregon in the 1980s. And it, it went mm -hmm. into two sections. Right. It's you've got the conservation rewilding and anarchist rewilding. Um, and so that anarchist philosophy was like in there from the beginning. You know, anarcho primitivism uh, was central to rewilding. But now rewilding is used as a synonym for primitive living. And so people in the ancestral skills community that are doing primitive living are calling themselves rewilders or doing rewilding, but they actually don't understand anything about the history and anthropology of humans and humanity. And, you know, they're like, I'm a modern hunter gatherer, but they've never read a book on what hunting and gathering economics ever looked like. Right. And so, yeah, they're projecting um, these notions into what they believe. And, and I think that that the term wildness is one of those that that I mean, this also this also happens within the anarchist milieu as well, where people come, they join anarchy. They don't actually well, they call themselves anarchists. They don't actually understand what anarchism is. Um, they think it means like no boundaries. I can do whatever I want. Right. right. Which is not what anarchy is at all. Um, anarchy is a collective um, culture. It's not individualism. That's like libertarianism or whatever. Right. Um, so I think there's a lot of people who are actually like individualist libertarianists that call themselves anarchists that don't actually know what anarchy is at all. And there's an interesting mix of of that within the ancestral skills and primitive living or primitivist um, ideology and, and movements. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of the importance to me of of these kinds of conversations is like holding down what rewilding actually means. And for people to use that word, they actually should probably read <laughs> some anthropology and dismantle the contemporary ideas that they're projecting onto themselves or onto the way of life that they have or, or want to have. Right. I mean, reading books always helps. So. <laughs> yeah. And um, wh what would you say are the entryways for, for ecofascism into rewilding? Like... Well, I think I think that's actually probably one of the biggest ones is just the word wildness or wild mm -hmm. and it's and it's misunderstanding of that um, and then how that can kind of get into um, a lot of the other a lot of the other aspects of rewilding because that's a foundational ideology is what is wildness. And if you think wildness means aggression um, and individualism and mm -hmm. domination, uh -huh power yeah then you're you're gonna from the foundation of everything you do you're just going to be recapitulating the systems of civilization that have brought us to the brink of extinction right so mm -hmm. um <laughs> yeah i think that's i think that's the biggest one um what are the one what are some that you see um yeah i mean what i what i see is that the eco-fascist scene, so to say, um, of course, they don't call themselves eco-fascists, right? right? 
So they publish books or um, very posh magazines about certain nature topics. They interview anarchists for these magazines. They uh, published a book about Earth First. Um, the reason for it was they said that uh, they wanted to show that um, uh, ideas of ecology don't necessarily have to be leftist. And uh, that's why they published this book. And uh, a strategy of, of the right is, is what we call in German a queer front strategy, which could translate into like a cross front strategy. So they say like, oh, um, you know, you you want to protect the forest. We also want to protect mm -hmm. the forest. Let's protect the forest together. And then later on, when we reach our goal, we can figure out who wins, so to say. And these strategies were successful in the past quite a lot. And um, I think this is where, you know, when when they promote ideas like nature connection, um, ecology, um, nature conservation, and um, this then attracts people who are probably active in, in the wilderness movement and they do not know what is behind these ideas and, and these uh, these books who is actually publishing them. And uh, this is probably an entry way that people cannot really understand what is going on because um, it, it di disguises itself into something else. And then I also see a lot of like different points, for example, nature spirituality, you know, like people are saying, Oh, we don't want to uh, cultural, culturally appropriate Native Americans anymore. We want to look for a um, religion, nature-based religion of our own. Yeah, and then they go uh, into like uh, alternatives to Christianity and um, don't see that that this was already promoted by National Socialism, um, who um, promoted. Uh, Christianity as um, a foreign religion that colonized Europe and uh, was was basically, um, um, you know, a quote unquote Jewish religion, right? So, um, um, and I think a, a lot of people do not know this and get into circles that they will find connections to to ecofascism there, for example, right? And um, another thing is. Um, what I never really thought about, for example, in, in general media, it's promoted that uh, German people have a very strong connection to the forest, like by nature. And uh, it makes you kind of wonder uh, what this actually means and where this is coming from. So these are ideas that are much older than, than National Socialism, come from the Romantic period and were picked up by national socialists and connected to, to nationalism and fascism. And um, it, it kind of makes you wonder when I find something beautiful, is it really because I find it beautiful or because I was brought up to find it beautiful by, mm. for cultural reasons, mm. so, yeah. Yeah, interesting. For example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I, you know, you're kind of listing some of these um, entry points. And I think there's a couple more too that, that popped into my head in terms of in the States, yeah. there's like um, gyms, just like workout gyms. There's okay. this whole, there's this whole like um, organization. And I hate saying any of these organizations by name because I don't, you know, no press is bad press. Yeah. Uh, but there I'm, are, I'm avoiding that too there are this there's a whole collection of like gyms across the united states like a brand um and they're they're essentially a fascist gym um and they have like you know uh they they prey on i think male loneliness if that's if that's what it is sort of you know or or men that are um that feel lost and are are looking for belonging i think this mm -hmm. is one of the biggest things that they use is this sense of belonging yeah which, um and and i and i want to connect this back now i had that asterisk earlier from when we were talking about blood and soil right like blood and soil is like you belong to the land and you've been part of this land for a really long time like since time immemorial right right um 
and then there's boundaries around who actually belongs and who doesn't. Um, and you see this uh, popping up in leftist areas as well when it comes to settler and indigenous identities, right? Where settlers don't belong here. Um, and of course, most indigenous people don't have power to be able to inflict any kind of rules. But within leftist circles, the power dynamics have been um, sort of inverted in ways where the social status of people can can um, influence the social status of others. So you have, you know, people who have the identity of a settler, for instance, not having as much say or um, being denigrated because they're a settler. It's used as a derogatory term, for for uh, for for instance. Um, and all of this is like, you know, uh, becomes a challenge because for, for a few reasons. One, <clears throat> identity has always been amorphous. Um, the idea of people like of a homeland of like, you know, I have some homeland where I'm from originally, like of original people. There's no such thing as original people, right? Like humans have been migrating and evolving and um, intermixing forever. That's like, that's some, that's just the, the innate aspect of humanity. There is no original people. There's no original place that we came from. Um, evolution is just change and intermixing. That's, that's just life. So the idea of identity um, being linked to a place is a contemporary concept. In my mind, it's actually a colonial concept. Even if you're, um, I mean, because if you think about the, the name indigenous, for example, um, it means to be native to a place. But now when that is invoked, it's actually um, sort of the snapshot in time that of when capitalism colonized a people. So an identity now becomes fixed that was before not fixed, right? And so there's this, um, there's this thing that's happened where identities are being fixed by the colonial system. And now you have things like in the United States, blood quantum, right? Which blood quantum is if you're a member of a tribe, you have to have a certain amount of blood quantum, which is like uh, your DNA or, or your ancestry that was a part of that tribe. For instance, you know, they usually do it in terms of fractions. So like, you know, if you're one fourth Cherokee, you can be part of the Cherokee nation and you get tribal membership and you get an ID card. Um, but if you're one thirty second or one sixty fourth, that's too little of blood quantum too far back in your ancestry. You don't get an ID card, even if you've been culturally raised as Cherokee, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and so this idea of identity being tied to a place or a time or a particular people like that in and of itself is super problematic. And it's so um, a part of both the left and the right in terms of identity politics. Like the, the right is constantly like identity politics are bullshit, but they're actually doing it too on a deep level. They just don't acknowledge it. Right. right. Um, and so I think that one of the challenges that we face in terms of rewilding, in terms of like anti-fascism is actually um, because I think socialists become fascists very quickly as well. Right. So the left you know, look at like all of the socialist revolutions that have happened around the world, not all of them, but so many of them end up becoming authoritarian or fascist um, in trying to recreate or create their social systems. They just become this hierarchical dominating force. I think of like, you know, Cambodia, right? Like Pol Pot was supposedly trying to create a socialist system over there and then just like slaughtered, you know, how many people, right? I mean, it, so you have to kind of look at what are these like um, center points that end up creating these systems. And identity is a huge one. And this yeah. idea of blood and soil, it definitely is at play on the left, too, of, you know, it's in my blood or it's in my nature to be a certain way. Um, right. And I think the problem or not necessarily the problem, but um, what people are seeking is belonging. Like humans innately, I think we, I think because we've evolved socially for so long, what we want is belonging. And so we're looking for a place where we can feel like we belong unconditionally, 
right? Like unconditional love. If I go to um, a so-called leftist, um, although, you know, there's some people who don't believe there's a left at all anymore. Um, but if I go to uh, a leftist circle and I'm told that I don't belong for whatever reason, or I'm seeing memes on the internet that are telling me I don't belong or that I need to go home or like these different things, you know, um, that's going to turn me away from it because on a deep, on the deepest sense of self, I'm looking for belonging. So I want to, what does belonging mean? Right. That, I think that's sort of the antidote to a lot of the, like the blood and soil or the identity politics. The, the antidote is how do we make people feel like they belong? Everyone, right. not just our demographic, you know? Um, and if I get turned away from the left, you know, who are like, white men are stupid and blah, 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 which I see memes all day long on, on Instagram from my friends that are saying things like this, you know, um, you know, then what am I going to turn to, right? Like where I'm going to turn to where I feel like I belong unconditionally. I'm not personally going to become a white supremacist, okay. um, but I don't, I understand why, because belonging is more important than ideology, Right. And I think yeah. that's what people I think th that they know this and they get into these circles where they can they, they overlap with movements, make yeah. people feel like they belong together. And then at that point, ideology doesn't matter because you belong to this group. I mean, that's cult dynamics as well. Right. Like you yeah. want this you want to bring people in, give them a sense of belonging and membership. And then, you know, oh, it's too late. Now we're killing all the Jews in Germany or whatever, right? Like, or um, now we're, you know, in like in Rwanda, we're going to kill all of the Tutsi people, you know? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. 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 What, are, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree that there's like a lot of gatekeeperism in, in a lot of groups. So you first have to fulfill certain things wear wear certain clothes and 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 drop certain names and then you're accepted uh, around the fireplace and what i've been wondering about is why um i don't know in the, i think it's different in the us but uh in, in germany i'm always wondering so uh why are we not talking about who is sitting around the fireplace with us and who isn't because the fireplace at, at the wilderness schools does not resemble wider society so many people are left out. Many people are not belonging or they don't feel they belong. They don't feel they can go there. Um, and that I think has several reasons. Like it's money, for example, because basically you can sit around the fireplace if you have enough money and you pay for the course. Um, if you know the right people, um, if you feel like the people resemble yourself. So it's really mostly white people in, in, in Germany at the wilderness schools. And um, we are not a predominantly white society. We are a very diverse society, so even if you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that, but um, it's, it, it's true. And uh, so, so these are a lot of things um, I believe are problematic and should questions the, the, the wilderness schools scene should, should ask themselves and, and be open to discuss these questions. And sadly, I feel they're not because uh, whenever there's like a critical remark then people get very defensive. So we had a conference earlier this year, which was one month uh, after the rewilding conference um, of German wilderness schools. And whenever there was just a slight critique coming up after a talk and, and questions were raised and um, you know, people would get very, very defensive and said, yeah, uh, these, these critiques are destroying the movement. And, um, you know, so yeah. I think that's, that's a big problem. <laughs> you cannot talk about the things that are actually making us vulnerable to, to infiltration from, from eco-fascism. Totally. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. I, and it's the same here. It's the same here with, you know, um, in, in particular ancestral skills gatherings, you know, when when we, Rewild Portland um, took over Echoes in Time, which is, you know, almost 25 years old, um, the central component of that was ancestral skills are for everybody. And this event is for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and when I took it over, I looked around and I was like, 
why isn't everybody here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yes, and so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and there's and and I feel like people don't really want to do um, it's really hard to to think about that. And, and also it takes generational planning. You know, I mean, and that's the thing. I think people want I, I think there's a lot of um, particularly within activist circles that are thinking of a quick fix, you know, um, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of anger and upset for all important and, and logical reasons and, and everything. Um, but that's not like the timeline of how things change is generational planning. Right. Um, and there wasn't like anti-racist generational planning like 100 years ago. Right. Like, um, you know, African-Americans getting the right to vote. That's not generational planning. Right. Mm -hmm. That's just a new that's like a new point of access. But it's not generational planning to have diversity of leaders in 100 years. Right. And so even though it's been a really long time since they've had the right to vote, there aren't uh, there isn't a lot of diversity within the leadership. Right. Um, and so I think it's the same with any of this stuff. But then how is you know, so people tend to give up, I think, because um, there's a there's a desire for a quick fix. And when you try things out and they don't work and then you get even more criticism, you know, um, it's really easy to just give up. And I feel like a lot of people have done that. And I've, I go through these like waves of, you know, I give up. This is just too challenging. Um, but there's just some central part of me that just really has a desire to figure this out. And, and it has to do with this like generational planning. Right. Okay. I think um, when you were you mentioned the. Um, looking around and, and and not seeing diversity it makes me think of the yeah. the notion of like ethno nationalism and tribalism and how the word tribalism can um mean a tribe of people but can also mean um you know factions of specific demographics of people mm -hmm. right um and how that that language can actually play to the advantage of eco fascists who are working mm -hmm. towards ethno nationalism Absolutely, yeah. So um, just as an example, also during that uh, conference I mentioned, there was a very interesting talk by somebody um, about, uh, it was labeled, we are the original Europeans. And it was very popular. And, and later on, there's a Facebook group, a wilderness school Facebook group. There was a big discussion. People were like, oh, I'm so interested in that. I want to find my roots. And um, no, I want to go, go away from the cultural appropriation of Native Americans. I want to find my, my true European roots, you know, and, and who, who am I and who do I belong to, you know? Yes. So it's the idea of belonging again. But then there's the question, who is European and who isn't, right? And um, as you as you mentioned earlier, you know, there has been so much migration um, within Europe. Um, oh, yeah. Who are the original Europeans? You know, they the don't Neanderthals. <laughs> yeah, for example. Or the Homo heidelbergensis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, it's definitely not the Germanic tribes that Heinrich Himmler tried to find, no. you know, because that's what he said were the original Europeans and that's what he based his ideology on. And so we have to be very, very careful because this is getting so close to eco fascism. Totally. And ethnic nationalism. I mean, yeah. what's interesting too, I don't know if you if you know this, but um, you know, seven thousand years ago, there was a wave of agriculturalists that came through and colonized Europe. This is seven thousand yeah. years ago, yeah. uh, and they came from you know uh, what is today called the Middle East, or yeah. I don't know. That's not the that's not the appropriate term or whatever. But um, you know, they they migrated from there and essentially colonized the area. Um, and but before they only know this now because of DNA sampling what happened in the archaeological record is that you see hunting and gathering tools in the soil and then within like a hundred years they're all replaced with agricultural technology archaeologically right and so the idea was well obviously agriculture is a much better way to live and when it was introduced to this area all of the hunter gatherers just like gave up farming or gave up hunting and gathering and started farming but now they've done dna tests on the skeletons of the hunter gatherers found in Europe. And they're different people, meaning there was a wave of colonization that came through and not just displaced, but replaced that population um, of agriculturalists, which is something obviously that we've seen all over the world since then. 
in various places, um, not just from the agriculture that originated from the so-called Fertile Crescent, uh, but, you know, agricultural societies all over the world have colonized other peoples. Um, you know, there's DNA evidence of this in Japan from the rice farmers of mainland China, or what is now actually Korea, 3,000 years ago, coming in and completely displacing the indigenous population there, or replacing. Um, and then there's uh, um, the island of Puerto Rico, too, um, actually has a like 2,000 years ago, amaranth farmers or quinoa farmers from um, South America came through and genetically replaced them. So, I mean, and this is something that we we keep seeing. So it's, you know, it, which says a whole bunch of things, right? It says, number one, hunter gatherers generally don't just transition to agriculture. Um, oftentimes they're colonized, right, from agricultural people. But two, these waves of colonization um, show that migrations and, uh, you know, who knows, there's no evidence in Europe, at least, that the farmers killed through violent means the hunter gatherers of Europe. Probably what happened was disease, just like in North America, you know, thousands of years later, um, disease is what killed most of the Native Americans. It wasn't that the Europeans that were colonizing this country had even superior weapons, even though they had guns. The bow and arrow from the bushes was more effective than a musket at that time. And so, you know, disease was the main cause. So the, anyway, they also, when they when they did the DNA tests of the hunter-gatherers of Europe, they had darker complexion. Yeah. So they were like darker Mediterranean skin tones. Um, yeah. So, and, and again, like this isn't to say one is better than the other. You know, the pale skin, the, the theory behind that now is that um, pale skin was an adaptation to an agricultural diet, which was um, less full of vitamin D because grains don't have a lot of vitamin D or hunting and gathering um, wild animals, fish, and, you know, probably European bison that are grass fed or whatever <laughs> wild bison have a better omega six to omega three ratio. Um, but those, that vitamin D was lacking in an agricultural diet. And so the human, the humans that were stuck in that society lost pigmentation, um, in their skin in order to absorb more vitamin D from the sun because they were lacking it in the diet. Um, so, I mean, you know, this is just interesting stuff because you think of like, you know, the the ideology that white people invented civilization, which is this great thing. You know, I mean, that's like the Proud Boys on their website. They're like, we're we're proud to be uh, Western chauvinists. That's their that's like their slogan or whatever, you know, um, because we invented the modern world. And it's like, oh, so you're taking the um, you're taking the heat for the sixth extinction. Awesome. <laughs> great. That's awesome for you. You're, you're taking the heat for all these horrible things that happen, even though they even though Western civilization in and of itself is a false notion. You know, um, the majority of of technologies came from other places or were, you know, like Rome, for instance, colonized and stole technology from everybody around them. Yeah, I mean, but uh, this is also when you when you look back um, at the, the original Nazis, National Socialism, they tried to prove the total opposite. Yeah, so they they try to prove also with like fake ar archaeology that all of civilization actually originated in Germany. And they kind of, <laughs> yeah, man, what? I saw a documentary about that. So it's it's crazy. So they they really um, you know with the with the swastika, for example, because they they needed um, after World War One they needed a, a symbol that that unified uh, Germans under under one one symbol. And uh, so they had these archaeological um, um, trips where they were digging up old uh, vases and, and, and cups engraved with swastikas and they would hold them into the camera and, and people would see this and they were like, oh yeah, this is like our original culture and we have to unify under this symbol because this is, uh, this is the, the original people who we are. And, um, so it's, was all pseudoscience yeah amazing i mean you can laugh about it but in the end <laughs> yeah. it led to well, right really, really yes. bad, yeah horrifying yeah. outcomes and i think that's that's what we have to be aware of you know so i grew up in 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 this country and with every history lesson in school it was clear this can never happen again and now we're closer than ever to it happening again. And it's so shocking for me. I, I don't even know what to say. You know, there are yeah. 
there are uh, black Germans um, activists out there and they said they have a suitcase at home mm -hmm. and in case they have to leave and they they, 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 they will leave the country and that's yeah yeah I have no words you know yeah so I, it's the same I mean you know it's interesting to again the parallels like you know um Oregon, the state of Oregon was founded as a white supremacist utopia and black people were not allowed in the state until relatively recently, you know, um, recently within the last like 50, 70 years or whatever. I, um, I forget the exact year. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's so in Portland is like one of the whitest cities in North America, even though it's considered one of the most liberal, um, you know, it it's still like you go outside of Portland and it's just like deeply racist um, in many, many places, you know, um, and it's the same thing where I, I, I know people who are, who are ready to go or are arming themselves for good reason. Um, you know, because we don't know here either, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. like, uh, there was like this whole, well, anyway, I don't want to get too, um, one of the things I think about with, um, I read this book recently and it's really good. It's called, um, the lies that bind. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about identity. I forget the name of the author, Kwame. I think that's, I think it's Kwame. Um, yeah, I think I read um, New York Times article about that book. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the things he talks about, he has a chapter on um, nationalist identity and how, um, you know, the, the idea behind it in some instances, you know, there's obviously like state nationalism and, you know, ethno nationalism are like these horrific forms of of, of identity creation um, to consolidate power, right? And to um, to form massive uh, collections of people for the purpose of power, right? But there, I think, uh, I think the one thing that I thought about a lot when I was reading that was again this notion of belonging. Like the challenge of creating a nation is to get all these different people to have a shared identity. <laughs> um, and how the antidote to state power and fascism is the same thing, but with a different ideology, right? Mm -hmm. Because in order for everybody to like fight against the system, they have to have a shared experience, you know? Um, it's like you were saying, you know, everybody in these circles tends to resemble each other. Right. And I think that that I, don't, I hate saying anything is like a natural part of humanity other than the sense of belonging. And I think we project um, uh, uh, ourself and we just automatically will have a deeper connection with somebody who we think resembles us more because we feel like we're more in a parallel environment with them or whatever. Right. So you get these like stages of connection. And um, the book, The Lies of the Bind, kind of goes through some of these. He talks about gender, um, race, class, nationalism, like these different things that kind of these overarching shared experiences is what I like to call them, um, that make that that bring people together. The lies that bind. <laughs> um, and I think that the biggest challenge with um, creating the sense of belonging is getting people to have a shared experience together. So, you know, um, rather than focusing on our differences, which I think is what right now the left repels people because all it does is talk about our differences, like, you know, in particular race, gender, which are all super important. And it's important to understand the differences between those so that we can create equality within those. But I think there's like an overarching aspect of identity and, and of our humanity that we are abandoning for these like microcosms that exist within it that then end up creating a deeper separation than a than a deeper connection, right? Um, which is why I actually think that class, you know, the, the, the anarchist phrase, no war, but class war. I really do feel like that class is the thing that binds most people together. They're, you know, um, whatever class even means. He kind of, um, in that book, the lies that bind he deconstructs the idea of class as well because class can also be super diverse in lots of different yeah. ways that i hadn't i hadn't really thought of before reading that but i still think that there's like 
um, some element. We're all humans first, you know, and if we don't think about the humanity of each other, but we look at, you know, what our differences are first, it's sort of like if you were to go on a date, a first date with somebody. And instead of being like, what are all the things that we share in common that we can talk about? You're like, how are we different? And how do we, you know, I, well, I'm this and you're that, and I'm actually not, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. Right. Like when you, when you're trying to, when you're seeking connection with somebody, the idea is to figure out all of the things that you share in common and then have a shared experience together around that. But I feel like within political movements these days, it's all about how we're different and it's all a competition for how we're different. And these are all elements that play into eco-fascism. They play into um, resource competition, right? Between people. And so, you know, I mean, even think about like, I, I think about the police, police violence in the United States is disproportionate to black people. Black, black people have more experience, more violence uh, from the police than white people. That's super important to talk about. But police violence towards everybody is the thing that's actually going to connect people because we have to acknowledge that we have a shared experience where police violence and murder happens to everybody and that's fucked up. Um, and yeah, it's, it's fucked up that it happens more to black people. But like, if I'm a white person, just like, and I think that's my identity and I hear that it's hap like police violence is a thing that happens to black people. I may not just actually feel the connection to that enough to do anything about it. But if we're like, actually violence is happening to us both and we should do something about it. And yes, it's happening to you more. That's an important fact <laughs> and that's fucked up also. But like, how do we actually create that shared experience and shared connection where we all realize that this shit's happening to all of us. Classism is happening to all of us, you know? And like, there's a, there's a book that I just got in the mail. I haven't delved into yet. Uh, but it's by a, a black author and a white author together. It's called No Politics But Class Politics. And their whole thing is like, you know, statistically speaking, if there's a demographic within the class structure that is experiencing the majority of those problems, but isn't, um, you know, for instance, racism, right, can be a, the, the economic disparities of racism could be addressed by just addressing classism, because if you address classism as a whole, you're going to improve the lives of the most disadvantaged people. And if those are a specific demographic, then you're actually improving everyone's lives across the board and addressing sexism and, and racism at the same time that you're addressing classism, which but you can get a majority of people involved in a class struggle because it affects everyone. Right. And so you solve this problem by addressing this one that connects everybody. Anyway, I'm, I'm sort of getting off topic, but I feel no, like this I, is, I, <laughs> I feel like this is related okay. to the conversation about belonging and about connection, yeah. because I think that eco-fascists play off of these differences. Yeah, sure. They, they, that, that's what they are. Like ethnic nationalism is basically what, that's what that is. You know, that's, um, I don't want to quote this, focused right-wing politician, but one of the things he said um, about refugees in, in Germany, he said, well, Af the, the people from Afghanistan, they can go to their country because they have their own country and we have our country. So we don't have a problem with them, but they should please leave and, and be in their country and, and everybody be in their confined space. And, and, and that's how, how it should be forever. So that's that's their idea that that people stay in their compartments and in their identities and their, you know, nationalist, uh, um, you know, uh, how to say, <laughs> but but you know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to, I, I would like to say something about the the, the class war in, in before everything. That's actually reminds me of uh the feminist movement in germany because uh they were always told like yeah when 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 we uh establish uh equality of of classes and, and we we demolish capitalism then feminism will also have its its time you know so like please wait and then <laughs> you know right. so yeah. uh 
I mean, I feel that I've heard it the other way as well. Like as soon as racism is solved, then we'll deal with the class issue. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it, it ends up being, I mean, I think it's just nationalism and states in general, <laughs> you know, it's the hierarchy itself. Um, right. Um, yeah, but what I'm thinking is like, um, I, I would say racism is, is something that, that, that we all should be aware of, for example, right? So it's not Absolutely. something that's happening to somebody else. It's happening in this society. And I don't want to live in a society where, um, the police is especially targeting uh, black people, which is the same thing in Germany, sadly. Um, and that's why I have to fight r racism as a white person as well. You know, it's Absolutely. all part of the same struggle. Absolutely. Right. Even though it does not affect me, yeah, as a person, but I, it affects the society I live in, and um, in the end, it affects everyone. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there's like, there's a thing called, um, there's like the, I forget the exact specific name for it, but it's like, there's a type of overwhelm that I think we're experiencing in terms of trying to transform society for the better. And there's just like so many different things that um, it's hard to know what to put energy even into. And I think that's another thing that tends toward having people sort of give up. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that, that tending to give up is uh, also a thing that lends itself to fascist identities because you don't have to care about anybody else when you join this particular thing, right? It like adds a form of simplicity. Um, it's not even avoidance at that sense. It's just like, well, I don't have to worry about this anymore because I'm just going to be a white supremacist or something, you know, like, and I think that that's a, you know, again, that's another one of the challenges that we have to face is this overwhelm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we, one of our prepared questions was also like, how do we protect ourselves? And how do we take good care of ourselves from facing all of these things? I mean, you talked about how you were threatened because these are the, the things you were talking about. And I think that that's um, very stressful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How do you uh, how do you do self care around all of this? Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to avoid the news a little bit, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm like um, protecting myself from from too much outside influence at the moment. Um, and uh, I think once I gathered all of my strength again, then I can be more active again. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I think I, I definitely need these periods where I just, you know, um, turn it all off and, and just go outside and be in nature, be in my garden, and do stuff with my hands, leave a basket and just forget about it all. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's funny, you know, like, I feel like that's such a deeply important thing. And there's also like guilt trips around that, too. Like, oh, you can just go and not have to think about that, you know, but it's like, yeah, everybody should have to do that. Like, you can't actually perform or do anything if you're burned out, you know, um, and I get I get burned out a lot. Um, but I, I also um, ironically, I don't know, I've, I was never really a, a jock as a child or, or into sports all that much. But um, the more I'm, uh, I, I, the more I'm able to like physically move my body. And like I was reading about, uh, you know, one of our Rewild Portland board members is a ADHD coach and mm -hmm. uh, autism coach. And, um, you know, lifting heavy things was something she was saying was like really good for the nervous system. And so now I do like weight training like twice a week or whatever, you know, and I totally notice a major difference. I'm just lifting heavy things. Like it really just is able to put my body into a, a good place. Um, and I, it makes me think about this, like the gym, these like white supremacist gyms or whatever, you know, like they're, they're doing these kinds of things that are helping people and then creating that identity and just trapping them. It's essentially, it's like a form of entrapment, you know, 
Um, and so I have like this idea, it would be great if there were more anarchist gyms. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, um, here here it definitely exists. So they have an, an anarchist boxing club, for example. That's or, awesome. Um, yeah. Training. I mean, I haven't been in a very long time, but you know, yeah, I know, I know that it yeah. exists, and um, also a lot of gatekeeperism there. But um, oh yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, but but um, I don't know. Probably opening another uh, uh, topic, but. Um, I think it's very important to see that that uh, eco-fascism, national socialism is a total ideology. So people getting targeted at gyms has a lot to do with the body. Yeah, and fascism is also looking into strong bodies and it's going right into the body. You know, it's not, a, not an ideology that stays outside of yourself. It's going right in, you know, and yeah. it's becoming a part of you. Yeah, that, that was right. their actual goal. Yeah, right. Ugh. I mean, well, maybe, I mean, the thing is, is I guess, you know, it's like taking something that helps people and twisting it in a weird way. You know what I mean? And I feel like you could do the same thing. You could have somebody, you know, embody anti-fascism doing the same kinds of things, right? Like the ideology is sort of secondary Mm -hmm. to the in in a sense to the like the embodied practice right anyway i just it just makes me sad <laughs> um there was something else you in in terms of self care that i wanted to mention oh you know i think you said not watching the news for me it's like social media oh yeah uh, because you know i'll see i'll see things from both sides of of extremism on the left and the right. Like I've been, you know, I get death threats sometimes from people on uh, the right and then the left, I'm, um, you know, told to shut up and stop talking and, um, you know, move back to Europe or whatever, you know, these different things people like to say. Um, so it's a weird, it's a weird thing to be sort of stuck in the, I don't think I'm in the middle at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like I'm being attacked and I'm somewhere, I'm like a centrist. Yeah, you, you know what I mean? Party, you know, and piss <laughs> off, so. What did you say? You can be your own party and just piss everybody off. Yeah, right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think staying off of social media is, is one of those things that helps me or uh, being able to have a group of friends that I can vent to that mm -hmm. aren't going to judge me one way or the other about a thing. Again, there's right. that sense of belonging, right? Like I have a core group of friends um, and we can kind of say whatever we need to say together uh, privately. And then it doesn't end up in a public forum where maybe I'll say something mm -hmm. when I'm venting that I don't even mean or, you know, that I would regret saying if it were in a public setting later. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, I think it's important to have private settings where you can say things in a sort of sandbox kind of way before you can fully articulate something to say it publicly, you know, um, where there isn't a threat of <laughs> anybody attacking you for the things that you might say, but instead, you know, a safe space in that sense um, mm -hmm. to be able to say what you need to say. And I think it's super important to have that. And I'm, I'm like, every day I'm like, and I'm so glad that I have this group of friends that I can communicate with in this particular way where I don't feel threatened that I'm going to get canceled or, you know, from either end of whatever it is that I'm saying. Right. Or judged or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Yeah. I agree. Do you have a group like that? Oh uh, yeah, sure. I yeah. have. Awesome. <laughs> like, friends from way back who do totally different things today mm -hmm. and, friends who are also more into like rewilding than like me, but um, friends who are artists. So it's, it's a very diverse group and that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Very important. Um, and I'm also very thankful because um, I mean, society is designed, civilization is designed that we're all getting more lonely and uh, separated from one another. And that's why it's important yeah. to keep up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like um, I guess this is sort of an open-ended question and I hate, okay. I, I don't want to ask 
No. I'm going to I'm going to ask it and then like okay. and then put it in more better context cuz I don't like the word hope. <laughs> but um do you feel like not not hopeful that we can create enough anti-fascist um ideology and collective energy and and sense of belonging um to prevent it from happening? I mean, the, the, this is such a complex question because like prevent it from happening where, when, um, what is hope in this context? But like, I don't know, inspired maybe is not the right word, but do you know what I'm trying to say? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Because I think I thought about something similar earlier. Um, I came across also on social media, um, a woman and, um, she told one of these right-wing politicians from that party I talked about earlier to shut the fuck up and call them all kind of names, right? And she's a real big public figure. Her her family is originally from Iran. And um, she didn't back down. And he sued her and she sued him back. And, and his case was totally dismissed. So he was allowed to say all the racist shit on TV he wanted to, but but she was fine and and... It, it was like she either pay 2,000 euros or go to prison for 40 days, right? If she's not willing to pay it and she's refusing to pay it. She said, I'm not going to pay it. Send me to prison. I don't care. You know, and this is getting a lot of attention right mm. now. These are people that make me very hopeful mm. because they don't back down. Yeah. They're not afraid. And yeah. uh, they point their, their finger to the parts of society where we try, try to, to turn a blind eye on. And, um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's a lot of mm. hope for the future. Like also future generations. I mean, I, I'm, I'm 41 now, so um, I'm looking at people who are like 15, 20 years old, and I can really see that they are basically living a diverse society, you know, they don't care if, if their grandparents came from Turkey or if, if, if their aunt is from Italy or, or, or their uh, father is from Ghana or wherever from, you know, they, they just stick together. And I really love that. Mm. So I think that gives me a lot of hope. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Right. Yeah, I think, you know... Um... There's a an anti-fascist author who lives in Portland named Shane Burley, and he wrote a book. I forget the title of it at the top of my head, but basically it's like, you know, dispatches of anti-fascism. Or it's I think it's it's in another language, which is why I can't remember it, um, the title. And um, it's just interesting to think about how much people. And again, I think this I think this comes back to this idea that humans innately do not like to be dominated. <laughs> yeah. Um, Exactly. And the only reason we were able to, the only reason that we stopped living in these egalitarian societies is that the material reality of some of our cultural practices transformed mm -hmm. around, you know, 20 to 50,000 years ago um, through hoarding of food, through overconsumption of elements of the environment. Um, and then the sedentism and the hoarding of food created a material um, framework for dominance where one group of people could dominate others. You know what I mean? And with, you know, prior to that for a million plus years, the material realities of human society were geared towards this coalition against hierarchy, a coalition against these um, individuals who seek power. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel like that's, if there is such a thing as like human nature and if Christopher Bame is right, that we have an innate um, distaste to be dominated while simultaneously being able to create collectives that can dominate individuals, then the, the sort of framework that we have to come up with to fight the state would require a material reality that could support reverse dominance hierarchies or some form of leveling of power. Um, within the current material framework. And I don't know <laughs> how to do that. I wish that, you know, David Graeber and David Wengrow's book, The Dawn of Everything, would have actually given a material standing point for that instead of just being like, we can just dream our way out of this. 
um, which is great. We should be dreaming. Um, but what are the material circumstances that will make those dreams a reality? I don't know. Um, but I think that we have this innate anti-fascist or anti-authoritarian desire within us. And collectively, we can fight that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at it, it's not that long ago. No. I mean, 20,000, 50,000 years sounds like a real long time. It kind of is. But compared to how humans lived before, it actually isn't. No. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't like to be dominated. <laughs> no, it so, yeah. Um, cool. Well, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Mm -hmm. Anything that you haven't said that you're like, ooh, this is actually mm -hmm. one thing I really want to say before we go. Um, no, I think just just be aware. Yeah, be aware yeah. and, and um, dig a little bit deeper, you mm. know. Mm. read a couple of books <laughs> <laughs> what are your favorite books or books you might recommend books i might recommend oh my god that's hard, that's hard. well you I mentioned can... um the rise of eco-fascism early on so maybe i don't know if that was one you'd like to recommend people read yeah i I've, i haven't read it completely myself because i, I found it a little bit too late but I think um, it, it's really important that uh, their their idea um, they have in the, in the background is that um, the ongoing climate change is actually promoting ecofascism and the rise of ecofascism. And um, yeah, I think their book is probably something I would recommend. Awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm definitely going to read it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I definitely have to finish reading it now. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, Cara, thank you so much for coming on the Rewilding Podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. That was a cool conversation. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Rewilding Podcast. Check out the show notes to connect with my guest and for a list of resources that we mentioned in our conversation. If this episode inspired you, made you think more deeply, or gave you some new tools to use, make sure to subscribe and become a patron at patreon.com slash Peter Michael Bauer. If you're new to rewilding or want to expand your perception of it, I recommend attending one of my Rewilding 101 workshops, which I offer both in person in Portland, Oregon, and online for those who live around the world via Zoom. You can check upcoming dates and register at rewildportland.com. Thanks for listening.